and let's go. It is Wireless Tuesday. We are using WebEx Event Center to bring you this live podcast recording. If you are having trouble seeing or hearing, please use the chat panel. You'll see that in the upper right hand corner, probably in the upper right hand corner, depending on what, what you're using. And uh, be sure to send a chat to all panelists. If you have a question for our guest, please use the Q&A panel. We'll try to get your questions answered as soon as we can. We'll also try to consolidate all of the questions and make them available with answers on wirelesstuesday.fm. After the event, you will get a poll. We would love to get all fives. Can you see and hear well? Content met your expectations and the delivery was clear and concise. If we didn't earn a five, that's okay. Give us what we earned, but let us know what could we have done to earn your five? Definitely want to know. And today's topic was viewer submitted. Please uh, continue to do those because we listen to those and uh, continue to, to build those up. So I'm going to call for a quick moment of silence while we uh, get the recording started and we'll get going. <laughs> Welcome, welcome, welcome. I hope you're as excited as I am. It's Wireless Tuesday. Wireless Tuesday is a monthly podcast that revolves around Cisco Wireless LAN and related technologies. It's a way for me and my colleagues on the Cisco Global Wireless team to give back to the community that's given us so much. My name is Jason Grant, and I'm your host. Let's get it going. It's Wireless Tuesday. Today we have a really great topic, Stephen Heinzius, who is the EMEER lead for Software Defined Access, is going to talk to us about how we can fail as a wireless expert. So, uh, Stefan, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, well, before we get into the presentation, I'd like to get to know you a little bit better. Um, tell me, um, how, uh, how did you come to Cisco? How long have you been doing wireless? Uh, so. Um... I've been doing wireless, uh, basically, I, I used to be a voice engineer, and when Apple came on the market with the, with the iPhone, I thought, you know what, this is going to be the end of IP telephony, I thought back then, and I need to find a new specialty, uh, so what's going to be the new big thing? And I thought Wi-Fi would be a very good one, so I joined Focus on uh, 2009 on Wi-Fi. Little did you know that it was all going to come together. Yeah. Exactly. So what was your uh, what was your what was the first mobile device that you had? My first mobile device uh, there was a there was a Nokia fifty one ten back in nineteen ninety nine. Yeah. I know it well. I know it well. That was a great phone. I still think that if that would phone would work uh, on the networks today, that it would still work the way it did back then. I thought it was a great phone. So, um, tell, so, so we have this uh, presentation here called Seven Ways to Fail as a Wireless Expert. How did you come across this? What, what was your uh, inspiration? So when I created this story, uh, I, I wanted to give an overview of best practices for Wi-Fi. And, oh, my God, it was boring. So I decided, yep. you know what, um, I want people to understand what is the, uh, the, the best practices, um, but the way I always teach people is it doesn't matter how you remember it as long as you remember it. And uh, if you make some things funny, uh, people enjoy it better and they pay more attention and they remind it better. So that's how we came up with a, a session named Seven Ways to Fail as a Wild Expert. Funny note, um, when I submitted the title, the Cisco Live organization said, are you sure you're going to submit a session named Seven Ways to Fail because no one will sign up? And it became one of the most popular sessions. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Uh, I think they were wrong. Uh, how long have you been presenting at Cisco Live? Uh, my first time was 2015. And uh, then I did two per year. So both wow. in EMEA and the U.S. That is, uh, that's a pretty big schedule. Well, uh, thanks for bringing this presentation to Wireless Tuesday. Let's uh, go ahead and kick it off. Thank you. All right. So, um, I created this session, like I said, uh, um, 
I wanted to give an overview of how to do things right. Um, and there are several reasons for it. Uh, a lot of people out there tell you as a customer uh, they are a wireless expert, but you will see later on in the pictures that, um, well, they make so many mistakes uh, that they can never be an expert. So um, if you think hiring a professional is expensive, wait till you hire an amateur. Uh, what we're going to do, um, a quick introduction about myself. So this is me, um, my Twitter handle. Uh, by the way, I post a lot about Wi-Fi. I'm, I'm part of the wireless community. I've been an end user for three years. I worked in a water facility company. I worked as a field engineer uh, doing uh, call manager express and call manager installations at the partner for five years. I worked at a Cisco distributor for six years. I'm with Cisco now seven years, uh, running for eight this year. Uh, I'm a CCSI, an instructor, for 13 years. And in my spare time, I'm a dad, I'm a husband, I'm a runner. Uh, I'm a cook, mountain biking, uh, scuba diving, snowboarding, and a Wi-Fi enthusiast. So I'm that guy that walks around on an airport looking at the ceiling where the access points are installed. But in this audience, I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one. By the way, here on the picture you see my uh, my my beautiful wife and my uh, my two kids. So there they are. Um, what we're going to do and why? Uh, like I said, um, it's an overview of best practices, and especially in this audience, uh, by no means I think that I will teach you something new. However. Um, Technical audience in general find it difficult to explain to non-technical people why things don't work. Um, and that's what I want to give you. That's what I want to achieve with the 7 Ways to Fill session. I want uh, to give you the tools to explain to non-technical people why things don't work. So that is what I want to achieve. That's my desired outcome with the 7 Ways to Fill. Um, so it's basically 7 Ways to Fill. Um, and Honestly, I want you to learn how not to fail. Uh, it will be educational. Uh, well, interactive is going to be difficult, difficult uh, uh, on a WebEx like this. Uh, but at least I hope you will think it's fun. And uh, one of the reasons why I created it is because these are our three biggest fears uh, in our generation. I mean, if I see any of those three icons, uh, I get nervous. And um, I have two kids, a six and a nine-year-old. And if they see any of those three uh, icons, they, it, it's panic. And, and basically they tell me it is worse than having uh, no water uh, or no coffee. or it, it's, it's, it's a uh, primary um, uh, need for life, uh, the Wi-Fi. So, yeah. At the end of the session, I want you to become a wireless superhero. And... Um, to be able to explain to other people why things are uh, not uh, w working the way it should be. And um, everything that I'm going to share with you is applicable to Wi-Fi in general. Not just Cisco Wi-Fi, but Wi-Fi in general. And it works on, uh, on all vendors as well, uh, in including your own network. It's just about understanding Wi-Fi. So, we're going to create the baseline, we're going to do the, the basics first. Uh, we're going to look at how it all began, uh, the standards that are out there, the characteristics for Wi-Fi and the challenges that we see. Uh, and everyone knows that uh, the German Wi-Fi is the worst. So a quick understanding of the history. Um, Wi-Fi, the way we use it today, uh, a, a big driver for it was the barcode scanning. So there was a vendor called um, Symbol, which uh, later uh, became Motorola, which later became uh, Zebra, which then became Xtreme. Um, but that is a, uh, they were a big driver for uh, Wi-Fi. And uh, barcode scanning required about one meg of data rate, which was um, far sufficient. Um, and uh, no one thought that that uh, mechanism would be used 20 years later as the primary access method into the network. So to better understand this, um, I take people to the history of networking through uh, my own experience. 
but I want you to think of a company with 100 employees. Okay, so, so picture yourself a company with 100 employees. And the main question is this company with 100 employees, how many devices are on the Wi-Fi in 1999? In 1999, I would say maybe if they had Wi-Fi, one or two devices on the infrastructure. If we then zoom into 2005, there would be five to ten devices on that wireless infrastructure. Why? Well, first of all, 1999, what cell phone did we have? Like we discussed, I had a Nokia 5110. If you were a manager, you had a Nokia 6310. Um, if people, people didn't have a laptop. The, the, uh, the average employee in a company in 1999 did not have a laptop. In 2003, 2004, Intel came with the Centrino chip, which was onboard Wi-Fi integrated to the chipset. So you no longer needed the PCMCIA card. And you would see that in a 100 employee company, there would be, let's say, 10% of the employees would have a laptop. And they would be having um, uh, onboard Wi-Fi. And if a company had Wi-Fi in 2003, 2004, 2005, and I'm saying if because a lot of companies did not have, what it typically was, it was a direct internet connection plugged into uh, one or two access points in one area of the building, and that was the Wi-Fi. Um, so if there would be Wi-Fi, there would be five to ten devices on the infrastructure. Now, big leap forward into 2007, because in the 2007, 8211N came on the market, and also uh, the improved uh, um, WPA uh, encryption. So wireless became a uh, uh, higher data rate, uh, longer distance, and better secured. And at the same time, you would see that more employees in the company would get uh, laptops. And uh, typically, the people would still connect the laptop uh, wired. Um, and cell phones in 2007, if you, uh, if you would be an average employee, would still have a Nokia. Some people had the Motorola's and uh, the important people had the Blackberries, right? So um, those phones did have a Wi-Fi client in it, but they were not native Wi-Fi and they were not uh, uh, permanently on. So you had to turn them on. And if you didn't use it for five minutes, then it would turn off. So in a 100 employee company, there would be, two th there would be around 25 devices on the Wi-Fi. This is the time frame, 2007 to 2010, when a lot of companies reached out to their supplier and said, can you please design me a wireless infrastructure? And they designed that wireless infrastructure, and uh, they did it with the cheapest access points possible, but on latest standard. So what happened? You've got 8211N series of access points on 2.4 gigahertz single radio. Because they were saying, it's the latest standard, uh, everyone is a 2.4, a lot of clients don't support 5 gigahertz, which was true back in those days, so why would you need 5 gigahertz? And um, the networks were designed for coverage. So how many access points do I need throughout my building to have full coverage everywhere uh, at the lowest price possible? Then in 2010, a big change happened because all of a sudden, everyone started to have smartphones. It was the iPhone uh, that was on the market. There was the um, uh, HTCs. There were the Samsung phones. They all had native Wi-Fi, and we saw the first tablets coming into the market. So in a 100 employee company, all of a sudden, there were 150 devices. Keep in mind that most of those infrastructures were implemented in the time frame of 2007 to 2010, where in 2008 and 2009, with only 25 devices in the infrastructure, everything went, worked flawless. But all of a sudden now, when there's 150 devices in the same infrastructure, it became an issue. And while it was growing, in 2013, we saw that every employee had a laptop and every employee had a, a smartphone. And it became more and more normal that 
people have more than two devices. If you calculate, if you design an infrastructure today, you calculate for three devices per employee. Um, smartphone, tablet, smartwatch, people having a second smartphone, uh, uh, people having laptops. Uh, you, you see on average three devices per employee. And that is the new normal. And when you design the infrastructure for around 25 devices, it really became a big issue. Evolution from a laptop perspective. Um, this is uh, 20 years of evolution uh, from a laptop and uh, 20 years of evolution from a phone perspective. And I think, Jason, uh, that at least half of the phones that you see in there, you had them as well, right? It is likely, I, well, let's see. Uh, I had the flip phone. I never had a brick phone. That's, you know what? Maybe embarrassing. Never had a brick phone. But I had every single one of those. See? Yeah. And a couple more. And a couple more, yeah. yeah true, true, true. So here you see uh, evolution on the laptop side and evolution on the, on the phone side as well. And this is um, uh, uh, impacting the wireless infrastructure. I mean, the Nokia 6310, everyone had one, uh, running two weeks on a battery. Um, uh, you can smash it on the floor, it still works. Um, you can take it under the shower, it still works. Uh, if, you, if you would plug it in right now and you power it up, guess what, it will still work. Uh, it, we had some apps on it, like Snake, um, but it was not generating any, uh, any bandwidth uh, on the infrastructure. And here we have our smartphone. And the smartphone is generating, um, it has an average of 80 apps per employee uh, on a device. And those 80 apps, all of them uh, generate bandwidth and uh, consume uh, Wi-Fi airtime. So it has a big impact. So uh, a lot has changed there. If you want to go through the details, we have a thing called the VNI, the Visual Networking Index. I want to encourage every one of you, especially when you're going to uh, present something to, uh, to one of your customers and you want to uh, uh, tell the evolution of, um, uh, of networking, go into the VNI and uh, you get all kinds of data like uh, the growth of devices, the amount of bandwidth those devices uh, take and so on and so on. Very interesting facts and figures. All right. Um, Again, we have a fairly technical audience, so I don't have to uh, go into the details to explain you uh, that uh, a wireless access point is a wireless hub and not a wireless switch. Um, but I do want to give you some examples of uh, modulation and how to explain this to non-technical people. Um, question that I always ask the, uh, the audience, uh, what is exactly your frequency? And uh, uh, obviously that is the amount of uh, radio waves happening in a second. So in 2.4 gigahertz, that means basically there is 2.4 billion radio waves happening in one second and 5 gigahertz means 5 billion of those radio waves happening in one second. So the one, number one question that I get a lot is, isn't that bad for health? Uh, well, I was told, and uh, maybe uh, you, you heard this as well, Jason, uh, that um, if you spend a lot of time in Wi-Fi, you lose your hair, but I don't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard anything like that either. <laughs> uh, no, but, but, but to be honest, uh, uh, can Wi-Fi uh, damage your brain? Um, if someone throws it really hard at your head, uh, then yes. And otherwise, uh, uh, no. Um, to better understand this, I'm asking the audience, who uses the phone as uh, um, an alarm clock in the morning? So I, I ask people in the, in, the, in the room to actually raise their hand. And the cell phone is transmitting at one watt, which equals 30 de decibel to the milliwatt, which equals 1,000 milliwatt. And you know that a wireless access point in our standard is a maximum of um, 100 milliwatts, which is one-tenth of that. However, the RSSI at laptop level, if you have a fairly proper signal, an RSSI of 66 dBm, equals one four millionth of a watt. So you're concerned about Wi-Fi, but you sleep next to this. So if you're worried about this, I would be more worried about that than about the Wi-Fi. 
So I, I, I always try to explain uh, with this uh, the mathematics behind it. This is the actual transmitted uh, radio wave that you get on your body. Um, one fourth millionth of a watt. All right, <clears throat> I don't have to explain in detail to this audience the overlapping channels. Um, however, for you to explain it to a non-technical person, uh, I always explain it with the uh, example of a, of a radio in the car. Let's say you are listening to the radio in your car, and the radio in your car has got 13 channels. Uh, in the US it's 11, by the way. Uh, so you get 11 channels. And let's say all those 11 channels are transmitting their own radio station. Now, if all those radio stations are transmitting their own radio broadcast, and they all overlap, and you tune into channel 7, you don't just hear radio 7, but you also hear radio 5, 6, and 8, and 9. So how nice is it to listen to this particular radio station? I would say not nice at all. So what do you do? You immediately turn it off and listen to the sound of the engine. So what they did in um, the... Um, transmissions, they agreed, you know what, we're going to use only channel 1, 6, and 11. So even though we have 11 channels available in the US, or 13 in Europe, even though you have all those channels available, we agreed to only transmit at channel 1, 6, and 11. And with that, if you tune into channel 6, you only listen to channel 6. However, in 5 gigahertz, we have far more channels available. So there's Every channel is 20 megahertz, and all of them are non-overlapping. So, then they came up with a thing called channel bonding. They said, with all those non-overlapping channels available, why don't we do a thing called channel bonding? And it sounds great. It's a, it's a, it's a great technology to, to combine two channels and basically increase the data rate. They made one mistake. And the one mistake is that uh, the channel bonding um, was only available, uh, was part of the 802.11n standard. And they did not say it should be on 5 gigahertz only. So it's on both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. So there are some, um, uh, I would say, uh, consumer grade access points that support channel bonding in 2.4. Now, channel bonding, they took it uh, further to uh, go support 811AC with 80 MHz wide channels, and now we even support it on 160 MHz wide channels. However, because of DFS, uh, you cannot use all channels. Another thing to explain to uh, people, another question that I get a lot is, how do I compare a Cisco access point to another Cisco access point? Or how do I compare a Cisco to Aruba? or a Ruba to Ruckus, or a, a, a Meraki to an Aerohive. And the number one thing that I look at is uh, what we call MIMO, multiple in, multiple out. So basically, what it means, the first number is the number of transmit antennas, which is similar to the number of microphones that an access point has. The second number is the number of ears that an access point has. And the third number is the number of spatial streams. And the spatial streams is what, uh, um, rock, what uh, marketing departments uh, like uh, to highlight because the higher number of spatial streams, the bigger number they can put in the box. However, 70% of the clients are only one spatial stream. They are your cell phones and your tablets. They only want one spatial stream. If you have a laptop that is older than three years old, it's only one spatial stream. Um, the number of Three spatial stream devices is growing, but it's still significantly low. And the number of four spatial stream devices, um, there's no four spatial stream client. So that's also a reason why 600 megabits per second is part of the 802.11n standard, but it never was brought to market. Um, yes, we have access points that are four spatial streams, but there are no clients to, uh, to support those four spatial streams. It will become a benefit in multi-user MIMO, uh, but uh, we're not there yet. So here you see um, the correlation between the channel width uh, versus the range and versus the data rate. 
Um, one of the recommendations that I have to everyone, if you're deploying Wi-Fi in an enterprise environment, uh, use 24, 20 megahertz or 40 megahertz wide channels. And one of the reasons is that you will have a, a, a lower range. So, modulation. To understand the, co uh, the concept of modulation, um, modulation basically means that close to an access point you have a higher data rate than uh, the further away. So here you see a media coding scheme uh, looking at uh, 2.4 gigahertz with two spatial streams, 20 megahertz wide channels and a 400 nanosecond uh, card interval. So if you're close, you have 144 uh, meg and the further you're away, uh, the lower the data rate. So what is actually changing is the modulation scheme. So going from 64 QAM to 16 QAM to, uh, to quadruple uh, polar shift keying and so on and so on. So the further you're away, the, um, the lower the data rate because the modulation scheme changes. To explain this to non-technical people, I take them to a game called darts. And I know darts is not very popular in the US. Uh, it is very popular in Europe. Uh, but everyone understands what is the goal with darts. With darts, the goal is to throw the arrow in, uh, in, in the points. And if you're close by, it's easier than when you're far away. Why do I choose uh, darts? Well, apparently because I look like a darter. I'm not really sure if that's something to be proud of, but um, apparently I look like one. This uh, is Michael van Geren, who is uh, a Dutch guy, a uh, Dutch uh, darter. And no, he's not related to me. Um, so we're going to look at Michael throwing uh, his darts at the dartboard. And what you're looking at right now, he is throwing an arrow at uh, a 256 Quam constellation. And if he throws the arrow and uh, he misses, then what happens, um, because he missed, he did not get an acknowledgement on his message. So then uh, uh, the, the, uh, the radio will change the, uh, the, the constellation to uh, 64 quam, which will actually make the dartboard bigger, so it's easier for him to, uh, to hit uh, the dartboard. The downside is that instead of one arrow, he now has to throw four to uh, hit the same uh, message. Um, this is about how the, um, the constellation looks like if you zoom in and if you uh, actually did see the zeros and ones. Uh, you see that uh, getting a message across, uh, zooming in, um, you will actually see the zeros and ones. So if he misses again, because he still can't uh, uh, hit, get his message across and basically he will not get this acknowledgement, what happens again? the constellation will now change to 16 quam. But in order to get the same message across, he now has to throw 12 arrows to get the same message. So the higher the constellation uh, scheme, the uh, closer you have to be to hit the right point, uh, but the lesser arrows you have to throw. And you've got to keep in mind, if you now have to throw 12 arrows, everyone in the audience needs to be silent, otherwise he will miss. You get it? I would say yes. Other things happening, uh, shadowing, uh, reflection, uh, refraction, scattering, diffraction. We all have the, uh, the understanding of what, what, what's happening there. Uh, challenges that we see in Wi-Fi, uh, customers are complaining that it's slow, they can't connect, they can't roam, uh, it's not secure. How do we support bring your own device? Um, I want to do guest networking, but I want to make sure that it doesn't hog up the, the enterprise network. I have issues with coverage. I have interference. I have changing environments. It worked when, uh, when it was implemented, but it doesn't work anymore. Supporting Internet of Things and supporting uh, devices that were previously not connected. Uh, we now want the five nines of availability. Like I said, I was a voice engineer, and the five nines of availability is something very normal in the PBX world. But now we're wanting this on Wi-Fi as well, and how do you do that? And basically, Wi-Fi became the primary access method uh, into the network. All right, we have the basics, so it's time to look at some fails. All right. 
So, fill number one, it's an easy one, everyone understands. Fill number one is forget about those channels. Um, what you see here is a friendly fellow that parked his car in um, channel four, and basically he took out channel one and channel six by doing so. If you want to see how this looks like from a Wi Fi perspective, uh, it looks like this. So, you see channel one, six, and eleven and a friendly fellow that put his access point on channel 4 basically interfering with both channel 1 and channel 6. By the way, this is a picture I took in a Cisco office. Cisco UK if you want to know. Um, we can do a thing called containment. Um, containment basically means that uh, you make sure that uh, no one can connect to that particular client, uh, to that particular access point. Uh, for the record, containment uh, can be uh, illegal in your uh, country. Uh, if you want to understand from a car perspective how it looks like, uh, you will see this is containment. Um, but um, that, is, uh, that is something you can do. So, fill number one is the incorrect usage of channels. These are scans that I have uh, made in hotels where I typically stay. This is a hotel close to Amsterdam. And um, you can see uh, on the 2.4 gigahertz band, it looks very nice from a coloring perspective. Uh, we see uh, all overlapping channels and lots of interference happening there and nothing on 5 gigahertz. This is another hotel. Um, and here you see channel bonding on the 2.4 gigahertz band. So this is where you uh, have uh, two channels bonded together on 2.4 and you see a great overlap happening between all access points and again on 5 gigahertz there's nothing so this is what you get when you buy a home wi-fi router and you use it in your enterprise environment that is uh, one of the things that you get with the channel bonding in 2.4 so this is a uh, capture from uh, the hotel when I'm in Milpitas. Uh, Milpitas is uh, uh, in the Silicon Valley and um, uh, it's close to our headquarter, uh, close to uh, the brightest people in the wireless industry, not just from Cisco, but also uh, from, uh, from uh, Aruba, Ruckus, Ubiquiti, uh, very smart, intelligent Wi-Fi guys, and this is uh, the, the biggest hotel nearby. You wanted to say something, Jason? I'm pretty sure I know which hotel this is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll protect so, the innocent from not saying the name. Yes, please do. Um, so, um, everywhere where I come, I always do a scan on the Wi-Fi, and, uh, and this is the scan that I did. And I, uh, I went downstairs and talked to the IT manager and said, you have a problem on your Wi-Fi. And uh, she said, uh, we know. And I'm like, okay, that's already the first, the first achievement. So I uh, went to her and I explained uh, what's wrong on it and uh, she said uh, the next time when I came back, she said we solved the problem. And I said wow that's great. Um, so I asked so how did you solve the problem? She said we went to our supplier and they solved it. I said that's great, what did they do? They gave us more access points. Well. Um, I must admit, it looks a lot better, uh, but it's, uh, it's still not perfect. Uh, they did listen to some of my recommendations. If you go back here, this, this is the original one. Uh, here you see the round ones, and those round ones are the original, traditional Aeronet access points. So not the Cisco Aeronet access points, but the original Aeronet access point before the acquisition. Jason, do you remember when we acquired Aeronet? It would have been uh, somewhere around 1999 or 2000. Exactly. So those access points were in there from 1999 on. And I said, you should replace them. And she said, why? They still work. I'm like, not entirely. So... Coming back, they, they removed it, uh, so uh, uh, those, uh, those access points were no longer there. Um, uh, but they, have, uh, uh, they, they added a wireless head controller, and uh, a lot of the access points, they just could keep on using it. And you can see that they did use channel 1, 6, and 11 now. Uh, however, there is uh, an overlap. Um, there was a, a secondary wireless infrastructure that was not part of this same wireless controller. You can see those are the ones that are causing the overlap. 
Uh, the Wi-Fi right now is a, a lot better, uh, but it's still not perfect because of those overlapping uh, access points. So, adding more access points is not uh, the solution to those infrastructures, uh, basically because you get a lot of CCI, code channel interference. So what's wrong? Um, here you see uh, a, a cell with a couple of clients. Uh, carrier sends multiple access with collision avoidance. Uh, this is something different than in Ethernet switching, where you have carrier sends multiple access with collision detection. But because it's half duplex, uh, you cannot do detection. You can only do avoidance. And basically, uh, you're doing a CCA, a clear channel assessment, saying I want to transmit the data on the on the network. Uh, then the, uh, it will tell, uh, I'm going to transmit for 570 milliseconds, and basically you're setting the timers for the other clients. So they're saying, okay, we will be silent for 570 milliseconds, and then uh, uh, it's transmitting data, which will be acknowledged by uh, the, uh, the access point. So, um, reuse cluster, 1, 6, and 11, and on 5 gigahertz we have a lot better reuse cluster. Uh, the best practices from uh, a channel perspective, so minus 67 dBm on the edge of a cell, minus 86 uh, from uh, one edge to the, uh, to the next cell. Um, with that, you basically get a voice-ready network. Uh, planning on 5 gigahertz, um, my recommendation would be to do 40 megahertz uh, uh, if possible, and in very high-density environments, use 20 megahertz. Uh, in an enterprise environment, I would not recommend 80 megahertz, uh, but that is especially when you have a lot of access points. So best practices, only 1, 6, and 11, and 2.4. Use 5 gigahertz as much as possible. If you're doing voice environments, especially if you're using SpectraLink voice uh, phones, use the lower eight channels and uh, use them on 20 megahertz. Enable dynamic channel assignment, enable dynamic bandwidth selection, use RRM, and do not use maximum power. Going into field number two, maximum power. I have maximum power because I only have one access point. I need less access points. I'm designing for coverage. Uh, my site survey tool says all green, and it's the default. Jason Hintersteiner, he now works for Ingenious, uh, but he said setting transmission power is like drinking scotch. The right amount is great, but more does not mean better, and too much will make you sick. Uh, thank you, Jason. That's uh, absolutely uh, the right summarization. So, putting your access point on maximum power is field number two. Uh, if you listen to music, and as you can see, uh, I have my guitars here, uh, I play the drums, I'm a singer in a band. I, I love music, absolutely love music. Uh, but you would never do that on maximum volume because it uh, distorts the sound. And uh, the same goes for, for Wi Fi. If you put your access points on, on maximum power, which is uh, 20 dBm or 100 milliwatt, you get a lot of code channel interference. Uh, your clients cannot uh, cope with it because they are not maximum power. Typically, uh, a client, uh, keep in mind 70% of the client uh, infrastructure are these devices, uh, they transmit at maximum 25 milliwatt and you will have a reduced fault tolerance. So what's wrong on maximum power? Um, here you will see uh, a couple of cells and uh, a client moving in that cell. And when it's in the middle there, uh, it cannot decide to what uh, uh, access point to roam to because uh, all of them are uh, equally uh, transmitting at the same. And you also see uh, two cells at the same channel uh, causing co-channel interference. Another issue is the client is not maximum power. So here you see an access point transmitting. Uh, it's screaming to the clients. I talk to my clients very loud, so I'm pretty sure they can hear you. And uh, yes, uh, the client can hear uh, this access point, but when he's talking back, um, his message does not get across, so he will not get an acknowledgement. And what, what happens if he doesn't get an acknowledgement? Then the message gets retried and retried. And uh, basically, uh, uh, Clients that would be surrounding here um, would not be able to, uh, to use the medium because they're doing a clear channel assessment as well, and they will see that there is client transmitting at the medium. Uh, so um, you're causing uh, a, a lot of issues there just by putting your access point to maximum power. This is, by the way, a big issue that we see in hotel Wi-Fi. So they put uh, access points in the hallway, they put them on maximum volume, 
and um, uh, then clients in the room cannot properly talk back to the access point. So, reducing fault tolerance, uh, radio resource management needs to scale power up and down to help in case of coverage roll. Um, if the access point is already at maximum power, there's nothing to scale. So that is, uh, that is uh, reducing the fault tolerance. RM means dynamic channel assignment, uh, transmit power control, and coverage hole detection. Uh, best practices for power? Well, basically, do not put uh, your access point to 100% power. Use RM with a maximum set to 17 dBm and a minimum of 5 dBm. Uh, enable event-driven RM with rogue Wi-Fi contribution and keep the rogue duty cycle to a maximum of 80%. And basically, create smaller cells. Fill number three. 2.4 GHz is still the most important. Uh, plain and simple, the answer is no. Um, some people would go as far and say that 2.4 GHz is dead. Uh, I would not uh, say and, uh, and agree on that message, especially not with 802.11ax uh, around the corner where we're going to use 2.4 GHz again. Um, but um, but uh, designing the Wi-Fi for 2.4 GHz is not the way to do it anymore. Mm. So, uh, fill number three is only designing for 2.4. Um, designed for 5 GHz, all access points are dual radio. They will support 2.4 GHz clients. There's a feature called Band Steering or Band Select to push clients to 5 GHz. Uh, all developments are on the 5 GHz band and not on 2.4 because basically there's not enough channels and too much interference and too much other devices. And with other devices, I mean devices that are in 2.4 GHz but are not following the Wi-Fi rules. So what I let the audience always do is raise their hand and talk with me and, I'll, and tell me, I'm a specialist, I know my stuff. And as a specialist, I pledge to no longer buy or sell 2.4 gigahertz single radio devices or access points. If we all in the room can agree to this, we will improve Wi-Fi. So the next time when you see your company making an order for laptops, phones, barcode scanners, it doesn't matter. If it's on the Wi-Fi, please check that it supports 5 gigahertz. All right. So 2.4 gigahertz best practices. Um, design for 5 gigahertz. If possible, take out 2.4 entirely. Uh, so what I see more and more happening is that uh, the primary SSID is on 5 gigahertz only, and there's a secondary uh, SSID called um, uh, Company Legacy or uh, uh, Company 2.4, uh, basically giving legacy devices their own separate SSID. Please don't buy single radio APs anymore and don't buy single radio clients. And yes, this also goes for your home network, okay? So the next time when you're going to buy an access point for your home network, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure you guys know this, but please send out the message to your friends, family, and so on as well. Uh, ask them to consult you before they buy a new access point for their home infrastructure. Uh, if you have legacy clients, um, um, if possible, migrate them and use flexible radio assignment, uh, FRA, which is available in the 2800 and 3800 series of access points, and the new 4800 as well, uh, where you can have both radios on 5 gigahertz. Field number four, everyone's favorite, the placements. Really? Does it matter? Yes, it does matter. So what you're seeing here are pictures that you can find loads on, uh, on um, Eddie Ferrero's website called badfi.com. Um, you will see pictures of wrong installations. Um, basically, um, in a school, they want to protect the access point. Uh, and yes, they are protecting the access point from everything, from every sort of access. Uh, putting an access point behind Faraday's cage um, is protecting them from access. Yes, that's absolutely true. So, <clears throat> some examples of wrong installations. Um, this is, all these pictures are from one customer I uh, took in France. It's a manufacturing environment in France. And uh, I was invited there to uh, uh, talk about their Wi-Fi. They, they told me our products uh, are underperforming. And uh, when we came on site, they uh, had to agree that it was not 
according to the best practice installed. So here you see an uh, access point duct taped around the metal pipe. Uh, you see um, duct tape uh, in a production environment. Um, at a certain point, uh, let loose. So then they are hanging on their own wire. Uh, you see two access points within an area of around two meter. And uh, this is two different type of uh, access points. It's a 2600 and an 1100 uh, in the same environment, uh, where there's also a uh, ceiling mount access point that is put on the wall, uh, which is wrong for the polarization perspective. So you see four errors in one picture. And uh, this was the access point covering uh, the hallway, uh, which was a pretty large area, and it's right above a metal pipe. And as you can imagine, the coverage was not fantastic. And this is the main access point in the main hall, and it's lying upside down in a metal uh, wire. Um, you can, again, imagine that the coverage for this particular access point was not, uh, not perfect. So, what's wrong with those access points? Well, two types of uh, access points. We have carpeted uh, areas and ruggedized environment uh, access points. Um, and it's really important that you do the polarization correctly with the antenna. So, here's an example where it's well done. This is in the London subway. Uh, London subway is a pretty difficult environment, but this is how to uh, properly uh, install those antennas. And this is the uh, airport in Vienna, in uh, Austria, um, where it's on a metal wire, but there's a wooden plate behind it and uh, properly installed uh, wireless access points. Uh, not so well done. Um, I was told that our access points come with a feature that um, I was not aware of, but apparently our access points support stacking. Did you know, Jason? That is spectacular. I didn't know that, actually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and everyone knows that uh, stacking works best. Uh, if you want to do stacking, you need to do it in your wiring closet, right? Um, and if you're going to install Wi-Fi, you probably want to do outdoor Wi-Fi as well. And, and, and why would you uh, buy an expensive outdoor access point if you can do it the MacGyver way? So... If you're going to do wall mounting for 2700, 2800, 3700s, and 3800s, uh, this is how to properly uh, do the antennas. Uh, so antenna should be uh, pointing up or downward. That has to do with the polarization. And uh, with the new 2800 and 3800, it looks like this. Uh, but basically, uh, to memorize, our access points are designed for ceiling mount. And antenna should be either down or up, not to the side. Does it matter? It absolutely matters. So here you see uh, uh, vertical polarity on the left side, and you see if you would put those access points in uh, uh, horizontal polarity, you see that the coverage area is a lot smaller. So antenna should not be done like this. Not two different types of antennas. And if you're going to work with external antennas and you still want to save cost, it's not best to save the cost on the antenna. In a situation like this, the Wi-Fi will not be perfect, but it's not the Wi-Fi to blame. So best practices, um, put the access point horizontal below obstructions, minimal one meter away from obstructions, uh, correct antenna and only one type of antenna, three meter away from each other, not too high, so after four meter of height uh, you do special implementations. Don't put them behind a metal cage and use outdoor access points for outdoor coverage. Fill number five, I am secure about encryption and authentication. Um, this is a picture I took from a large European public uh, service infrastructure uh, where they gave away uh, their SSID and their own username and password. So uh, this is in the secured area and I was surprised to first of all see this picture and second of all, that I could actually take a picture and take it with me. So this is an interesting website called Wiggle.net. And on Wiggle.net, you will see that uh, there are right now 411 million wireless infrastructures. Uh, I would encourage every one of you to have a look at Wiggle.net and you can find your home address and you can 
see uh, your own SSID and how it's configured and how it's secured. What is interesting here is that only 61% of the wireless access points, only 61% are WPA2 secured. So that means that all the other ones are not properly secured. So that is an interesting fact uh, for me. Um, it is, did increase over time. So this is a picture from last year. And last year it was only 51%. So uh, it did improve. Um, but you can see that still only 61% of all the uh, wireless infrastructures are WPA2 secured. So talking about web encryption, um, you can't have WPA2 cracked if you're still using web, right? I actually had a customer that told me that because WPA2 has been cracked, they're going back to web encryption. I'm like, really? But hey. Um, an overview of the number of wireless access points, uh, wireless hotspots uh, with low or no security. And uh, here you can see that uh, in the US, there's quite a lot of uh, low security. And uh, in Europe, we're a little bit further uh, on, on the security level, uh, but there's still a lot of wireless uh, infrastructures that are not properly secured. So fail number five is not enough attention for security. And basically, when we talk about security, we talk about encryption and uh, authentication. And uh, for WPA2, um, use CCMP, AES CCMP. Do not use TKIP because if you use TKIP, not because TKIP is not secured, but if you use TKIP, uh, it reduces your data rate. So you can fall back on 54 megabits per second. So best practices for secure security. Securing Wi-Fi, there are three pillars to build on. So you can build your uh, securing your infrastructure, which basically means wireless link controller hardening, access point hardening, uh, local certificates, port, uh, port security with 802.1x, and so on and so on. You can do RF security, basically meaning clean air and wireless intrusion prevention. And you can do client security, basically meaning authentication, encryption and client, uh, of client to sessions. If you want to go into the details, there's a very good session. Uh, uh, did you already have Federico in one of your uh, uh, Wireless Tuesdays? Not yet. I would say he's a, a good one to talk about securing Wi-Fi. His sessions are really, really good and he's building on those three pillars. So my best practices, WPA2 is the bare minimum. With CCMP, do not use TKIP. Again, TKIP uh, is not because it's less secure, but it's only uh, uh, degrading your performance. Um, there are some warehouse environments where you still need to have TKIP because your barcode scanners require it. In that case, I would recommend to b take a separate SSID uh, where you enable TKIP. Uh, WPA2 personal is for Personal, okay, so don't use it in an enterprise. Uh, WP, uh, WPA2 Enterprise uh, for Business uh, is with 802.1x authentication, where you can do role-based access with ICE. You can use wireless intuition prevention. A recommendation is to use a VPN on public wireless connections. Even on your phone, you can install the Cisco AnyConnect client on your phone and uh, um, use that one uh, to uh, use on public Wi-Fi. Bill number six, hype versus reality. Um, I always have this one because if you, um, if you have a romantic moment with the love of your life on the front of the ship being the king of the world, but the reality is a bite in the nose, you are really disappointed. And um, when you look at Wi-Fi and you look at uh, the marketing around it, uh, everything looks amazing and it looks great, uh, but the reality is a little bit more disappointing. So I want you to understand what is uh, hype and what is reality. Because we want, all want those big shiny numbers, but how real is it? I mean, you see um, a wireless access point that supports 5.2 gig downstream. Yeah, well, um, theoretically, yes, but let's see how real it is. Uh, to come to, uh, to where we are with Wi-Fi, uh, there are three main stakeholders here. Uh, there's the IEEE. The IEEE sets the standard. 
Then there's the Wi-Fi lines uh, doing the uh, interoperability. And then there's uh, vendors that have their own uh, special uh, features. Uh, in this case, Cisco is my favorite one. And uh, basically, uh, what they bring uh, in the IEEE is uh, the, the uh, listing of what is the technical standards and the technical requirements uh, for a particular standard. Then in the Wi-Fi alliance, they make sure that uh, a product from one vendor can work with another vendor. And then uh, vendors have their own uh, differentiated features where they can say where they are better or faster or smarter than any other vendor. So, Adafruit AC is there, and I'm so excited! We can go to one gig, and it's true, we can get to 1.3 gig. However, to get to 1.3 gig, it comes with a price. So we need to be on 80 megahertz wide channels. We need to be on 256 qual. Going back to our dartboard, it means that we're close to the dartboard, and there should be no interference. Otherwise, we will have uh, issues to actually hit, hit the dartboard. So that's where clean air, client link, and all those HDX features really start to matter. So going into wave two, everyone heard about wave two. But when you actually ask what is wave two, they tell me it's 160 megahertz wide channels, it's uh, four spacious streams, and it's a support for multi-user MIMO. Those are the, the three big differentiators for wave two. So what it actually means, um, getting us a higher data rate on uh, gigabit Wi-Fi as a primary access. Um, so let's have a look at 160 megahertz wide channels first. Is it the solution to our bandwidth problems? And the answer is no. If you look at Europe, for instance, we can only create one non-overlapping channel in 160 megahertz wide. In the US, yes, we can get to three or maybe four if we don't have DFS, um, but it, it, it's causing issues uh, uh, with uh, overlapping channels again. Going into spatial streams, like I said earlier, uh, there, are only, um, there are no clients that support four spatial streams. Uh, the vast majority is only one spatial stream. And here you see the impact of the, uh, the modulation coding scheme combined to the data rate and um, to, the, to the bandwidth. So 80 megahertz wide channels, we can get to uh, 1.7 gig with four spatial streams. And that is exactly where we are with the 1850 access points. Now, you can see that the 811 ac Wave 2 goes to 6.9 gig, but it requires eight spatial streams. Now, I do believe that there is a market for it with um, um, infrastructure access points, where one ex infrastructure access point connects to another infrastructure access point. But for client access, it, it, it's, not, it's not going to happen. However, um, we can get to the 2.6 gig per radio, and if you combine them, two of them, in a flexible radio assignment, in the 2800 or the 3800 access point, you can actually get to 5.2 gig, but it requires two radios. Multi-user MIMO. Up till now, it was single-use MIMO. So I, as an access point, talk to you as a client, and you acknowledge my message, and then I can move on. And after you acknowledge my message, I can talk to the next client, to the next client, to the next client, and so on. With multi-user MIMO, I, as an access point, can talk to three clients at the same time at one spatial stream, and in downstream only, and the client needs to support multi-user MIMO. So multi-user MIMO will absolutely be a big benefit in the near future when more clients are supporting multi-user MIMO. However, looking at the market today, multi-user MIMO is not there yet. In the 8211AX standard, multi-user MIMO is gonna be a lot more interesting because first of all, there will be more clients, and second of all, it's going to be upstream as well. So today it's downstream only. I as an access point up to three clients at the same time. But the upstream communication is still single user MIMO. In 802.11ax it will be uh, uh, down and upstream. So that's going to be a big, uh, a big advantage. So um, is multi-user MIMO the solution to all our problems? Simple said, no, um, not yet.
Not yet. So, a to have an AC wave too. What to do? In summary, um, four spatial streams. There's no client supporting it. Multi-user MIMO. It's very difficult, and not many clients support it, and it's downstream only. 160 megahertz wide channels. Uh, very difficult in enterprises and especially in Europe. Uh, again, my recommendation would be 20 and 40, well, 40 megahertz, 20 in very high density, high density environment. And if you have a low density environment, you can have 80 megahertz wide channels. Uh, wave one clients cannot leverage wave two, and most new devices come to market support wave two. That is absolutely true. So what do you do today? Well, this is the summary. Wave two is about a higher data rate and wider, wider channels. Uh, where's my mouse here? Uh, higher data rate, wider channels, simultaneous data delivery with multi-user MIMO, and a better battery life. However, our 2800 and 3800 series and the new 4800 series of access points add the HDX, the high density experience features to it. And that is all about the flexible radio assignments where you can actually put one of the radios on five gigahertz and the other, the secondary radio on five gigahertz as well. Um, Multi-gigabit uplink, um, application visibility and control, clean air being the spectrum analyzer, the onboard spectrum analyzer, flexible DFS giving you the opportunity to uh, have the radio fall back on uh, uh, 40 megahertz wide channels instead of 80 when one of the channels is infected uh, by um, uh, uh, if one of the channels is affected by um, um, radar or something like that. Um, client link turbo performance basically means that we put dedicated memory and CPU power per radio, giving you a lot better performance for the clients and the optimized roaming with uh, things like 802.11R and uh, K and V. Um, so those are features that we have in the high density experience environments. And uh, don't just look at wave two, but look in whatever is provided in HDX. So the best practices for high person reality, um, move to the best access point that fits your need and look into features that are HDX, like client link, clean air, airtime fairness, optimus roaming. Uh, already our 2700 and 3700s outperform the wave two access points for our competitors. And the 2800 and 3800 series of access points are wave two and add those HDX features. Um, we have dynamic bandwidth selection and adaptive radio, um, MGIC support and mobility express for uh, smaller deployments with an onboard controller. It says uh, less than 25 APs here, what we already go to 100 APs now on mobility express. Fail number seven, of course I did a site survey. It's one of the conversations that I have with customers that tell me, yes, of course we did a site survey. But when you ask them how they did the site survey, they put one of the devices on tethering mode and then walk around to see how far is the coverage area with another device. Well, that is not a site survey. So film number seven, no site survey or no good site survey. Uh, there are different site surveys with different questions. So predictive site survey, giving you the answer to how many access points or where do you put them. Uh, Pre-deployment, which is an AP on a stick. Um, Post-deployment, does it actually work? And periodic site surveys to check if it's still working the way you designed it. So, testing for interference. Um, always do a passive survey to collect uh, information about the wireless infrastructure that's already there. Uh, do a connectivity test with an active survey to see how far is the coverage area when you're connected to one AP and do a throughput test to test the, uh, the different stages of performance. So we created the thing called the Survey Happiness Scale. So if you did a survey, if you did no survey, um, uh, we used it with uh, Jim Carrey uh, mm -hmm. because we could see his expression on his face. With no survey, Jim Carrey would be very unhappy and say uh, there's no, no, no way to work here. If you did a post-deployment uh, validation, uh, Jim Carrey would be like, oh yeah, that, we, could, we can work with this. Uh, if you did a predictive survey uh, with that, uh, he's actually happy that you did a solid uh, uh, design. And if you did all surveys, so including the AP on the stick, uh, Jim Carrey would be like, oh yeah, this is awesome Wi-Fi. Um, when we 
came up with the survey happiness scale. Uh, we uh, started with the Paris Hilton scale, uh, but it didn't really work out because uh, it was never clear if Paris Hilton was uh, actually happy or not happy with uh, the different stages of infrastructure. So, a question that we get a lot, uh, how fast do you need to walk? Um, the recommendation is to use multiple adapters. Uh, if you do two adapters, you can uh, do fast walk and run. If you actually do three adapters, one for 2.4 and uh, one for the lower, lower UNI band and one for the higher UNI band on 5 gigahertz, you can actually do it on a Segway. This is Keith Parsons. Keith Parsons is a uh, very well-known person in the Wi-Fi industry and uh, a, a teacher of many uh, wireless specialists, and uh, Keith is using uh, his uh, Segway to do, uh, to do the survey. So make sure that you uh, survey and um, know what you see. So even though it looks like a drywall, uh, it might be that there's a brick wall in it, and there's a big difference between drywall and brick wall uh, for, from an absorption perspective. And you also need to make sure that you survey everywhere because the main place where people use Wi-Fi today is the restroom. Yes, indeed. Um, a predictive site survey is not a site survey. It's a design, and you can't see any interference, and you can't see what's really there. An example is uh, where there's a design uh, made uh, just on paper, and when it was implemented, uh, the Wi-Fi was really performing bad, and mm -hmm. they didn't know that it was a, an aquarium uh, on stage. Um, active site survey connected to an AP. It can be an AP on a stick, different uh, concepts for AP on a stick. Um, uh, so you can uh, make it yourself or you can uh, buy one. Um, uh, AP on a stick basically means you connect to the AP and you see the coverage area uh, that that one particular access point has. Uh, common practices or mistakes on surveying. Um, only survey on the channels that you will actually use. Because if you uh, turn on all channels, uh, you will have to walk very slow to, uh, uh, to, to the survey. And if you need to do a coverage uh, area, uh, make sure that you walk on both sides of it. So in this case, this is a warehouse, and yes, it is a five kilometer walk that took us two days to do the, the full survey. Um, this is a, a screenshot from uh, the Eka House site survey. Um, I like Ekahau because you can do the spectrum analysis on board and it runs uh, native on a Mac. Um, spectrum analysis, uh, layer 1 troubleshooting going on in Spectrum, a uh, lot more than just Wi-Fi and you can use a clean air access point to do spectrum anal analysis and you can connect it to, uh, to a MetaGeek uh, channelizer to, uh, to see details. Uh, if you run Mac like myself, you can uh, use a tool called AirTool by Adrian Granados. Uh, with AirTool you can uh, do packet capturing um, and you can import that into Wireshark. So best practices for site survey. Um, recommendation is to do all four, predictive, passive, active and a post-installation survey. And uh, make sure that you see uh, add spectrum to it so you make sure that you cover everything. All right, so you made it so far. Um, by now, you are, I would say, a wireless superhero. Um, but I wanted to add one more fill, and the fill that I hear sometimes is that, ah, you're certified, but certifi certifications are overrated. And let's be honest, Wi-Fi is a specialty, okay? So I would recommend everyone to specialize in Wi-Fi, uh, start reading about 802.11. There's a lot of blogs out there. Uh, I, I just took a, a quick overview of uh, uh, famous people on, uh, in Wi-Fi uh, and their blogs. There are many, many more. Uh, I could have added yours, uh, uh, Wireless Tuesday, on this as well, uh, Jason. Sorry, I didn't. But we really need more wireless specialists because, well, uh, we are um, addicted to, to Wi-Fi. So get yourself certified. Uh, CCNA, CCMP, if you want to become a legend, uh, CCIE. Uh, if you want to be vendor independent, there is a, a, a certification called the CWMP. And uh, with that, you can become a certified wireless networking expert. And they are vendor independent, uh, so they cover all wireless vendors. Um, I created this thing called the seven ways to fail checklist. So by the way, 
by now it became the famous 14 because we have seven new ways to fail as well. Uh, so I have for you the, the, the checklist that tells you the fails and the best practices that, uh, that go with it. So by now you've learned seven things to look at when you are an expert or seven things to look at when you hire an expert. And um, well, if you think hiring a professional is expensive, wait till you hire an amateur. But if you search very well, there's always someone willing to do it cheaper. And with that, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, Stefan, that was great. I will make sure that your checklist is posted uh, or linked from wirelesstuesday.fm. Um, all of uh, Stefan's uh, Twitter and contact information will be there as well. And uh, hey, I'd like to invite you back to do seven more ways to fail. How about uh, same time next week? Sounds good. Cool. I'm in. Excellent, excellent. Thanks so much for that. Uh, so. You, uh, you heard it here first. Uh, next Tuesday, we are going to be broadcasting and we'll post up onto the Wireless Tuesday uh, podcast seven more ways to fail as a wireless engineer. Stefan, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. This is a great way to, to uh, convey a sometimes very boring topic, very entertaining. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. This has been a presentation of Cisco's Wireless Tuesday. Be sure to continue the conversation at ciscofullbars.com and at the top, click on the CFB Spark Community. There you can connect with scores of like-minded wireless LAN professionals. Be sure to subscribe to the Wireless Tuesday podcast using your favorite podcast player and stay up to date by subscribing to the Wireless Tuesday newsletter at wirelesstuesday.fm. We will see you next month for an exciting episode of Wireless Tuesday.